Political forces, economic forces, societal forces, even religions are changing before our very eyes. I mean, if we think of politics, you don't have to look much further than issues like Brexit or what's happening in some of the European elections. And of course, and apologies to the Americans, we do this all the time, Donald Trump. <laughs> A reality TV star who makes it to president. And then you look around the world and you realize that we're closer to nuclear war than we've ever been before. Uh, it, it's crazy. You've got this uh, guy who's surrounded by sycophants and, and a family who's telling him what to do. A childish guy with weird hair and his finger on the nuclear button. Still Donald Trump. <laughs> and North Korea. It's crazy where we are. What does it mean for us? as speakers. What do we need to do in response to this world that's changing so much around us? Will it change our careers? Will it change the industry that we work in? How do we respond? That's what I'd like to show you. And there are three things that we know for sure. Three things about where we find ourselves at the moment. The first is that the last 10 years have set the stage for absolutely remarkable change. The last 10 years have been some of the most remarkable in human history. We've seen more change in the last 10 years than I think we've seen in almost any decade in recorded history. I get to see this through the lens of my children. My oldest daughter, Amy, is 18 this year, finishing off school, heading off to university in a few months' time. And when she started school, just 12 years ago, here a photograph from that uh, first year at school in 2005, the world was a remarkably different place. I mean, 12 years ago, we didn't have smartphones. It was on June 29th, 2007, that Steve Jobs stood up and said, here is a proper phone. Now, some of you are thinking, hang on, 2005, I'm sure I had a Blackberry then. Blackberry. <laughs> That's not a smartphone. That's a fantastic way to send email and text messages. But it wasn't the smart ecosystem that we know today as smartphones. Most of you back in 2005, you either had a Blackberry, which was probably given to you by work, or you had a Nokia 3210. Now, the only good thing about a Nokia 3210 is it would still have battery life today. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my iPhone 7 here, it's nearly lunchtime, and it's definitely needing a bit of a recharge. And don't get all smug, you Samsung users who think, ooh, iPhone. If you've got a Samsung, the fire extinguishers are there <laughs> and there. We've got, all of us have got battery problems today. So it's not all good news. But 12 years ago, we didn't have the smartphone environment. 12 years ago, if you had come to a PSA event, you wouldn't have been able to use GPS in your phone. If you had a GPS device, it was a nice big chunky thing, suction cup to your windscreen. And 12 years prior to that, it was military grade technology. And now it's free for use in your phone. And it's how you'll get yourself home tomorrow. 12 years ago, almost none of us had bought anything online. We certainly weren't doing internet banking. 12 years ago, most of you hadn't Googled anything yet. You were still using Yahoo and here in the UK, Ask Jeeves. <laughs> 12 years ago, none of you had a Facebook account unless you were university students. It only opened up to the public 11 years ago. And the list could go on and on and on. In fact, there are over 50 companies that are currently valued at a billion dollars or more that didn't even exist 12 years ago. Now, obviously, a lot of them are the tech companies that, that we know and love and use all the time. But some of them are, are, are real-world uh, products like Fitbit or, or Blue Apron, uh, Apron and, of course, Tesla. Uh, most of these, I'm sure you know. Uh, this one, just by the way. Uh, don't shout it out, actually. Uh, Tinder. <laughs> you knew it. <laughs> probably, probably my favorite on that list is, is Tesla. Because Tesla is now, or as of March this year, Tesla is America's most valuable car brand. Highest market capitalization of all the American car companies. 
and its first car was only launched in 2008. The Roadster. The Tesla S, which is now what we know it for, is less than four years old. How does that happen? It happens because we have just lived through a decade of the most remarkable set of technology advances that the world has ever seen. And it has laid a foundation for what is about to come. So the second thing that we know for sure is that we tend to overestimate what we can do in two years while underestimating dramatically what we can achieve in 10. Many of you, as you sit here, maybe the last time you came to a PSA conference was two years ago. And you've brought that old notebook and you're looking through your notes that you took two years ago to the Inspire conference and you're thinking, oh, jeez, should have done some of that stuff. <laughs> some of you are frustrated. You're thinking, I've been at this two years, three years, four years. It, it, when is my breakthrough coming? You're frustrated at what you can achieve in two years. But you know what? I know a lot of the stories of the people in this room. Think back 10 years. I'd be surprised if there wasn't complete 100% looking back 10 years and thinking, good grief. Look where I am. It might not be where you want to be. Certainly not where you want to end. But look where you are. And we tend to underestimate what we can do in 10 years. So the most important thing that we know now is that the next 10 years is going to be unbelievable. We are going to experience unbelievable change in society. And if we can set ourselves up to ride that wave, to get ahead of the curve, well, it'll be amazing. Our problem is that our brains are programmed for incremental change. Our brains are programmed for a 10% improvement every year. The problem is that we live in a world of exponential change, of 10 times change. And when the rate of change outside our system exceeds the rate of change inside our system, our system is dying. That's true of anything. If the rate of change outside your business exceeds the rate of change inside your business, your business is going to die. If the rate of change outside your species exceeds the rate of change inside your species, your species is going extinct. How are you doing? Because the rate of change out there is 10 times. Now, The rate of change out there is 10 times because of this technological explosion that the last 10 years have just ignited. And I really do believe that we're just at the starting line of what is going to be a golden age of technological development and change. Just a few weeks ago, we got a glimpse of this future. We got a glimpse just beyond the horizon of our 10% view of the world. It, it did come in the form of another Apple announcement. Three Tuesdays ago, Tim Cook stood up and announced the iPhone X. He announced the iPhone 8 and 10 at the same time, and I didn't understand this until one of my German friends, and we seem to have quite a few of them here this weekend, explained to me that the German 9 is not going to sell well in Germany. So, I don't know, maybe that explains it. <laughs> but the iPhone 10 can do 600 billion instructions per second. It has one of the most fantastic resolution screens ever put into a handheld device. And we are going to call it a phone. That, my friends, is a supercomputer. That may very well have the same processing power that the entire world's computers had when I was born. And it's just a phone. Add to that 
the advances coming in artificial intelligence, chatbots, uh, machine learning, the Internet of Things, the instrumentation, interconnection and intelligence that is being built into every part of the system, including into ourselves. Add to that technologies from 3D printing to driverless cars and drones that can carry people, none of which are predictions, all of which are real already. The next 10 years are going to be remarkable. Well, remarkably bad for some because now the machines are coming for the professionals. It's no longer just coming for the factory workers or for the miners, uh, for the laborers. It's coming for the people who use their brains for a living. It's coming for the lawyers, the engineers, the doctors, the actuaries, accountants, architects. And very soon they are going to be without work. Luckily for us as speakers, I don't think that that is our fate. I am absolutely convinced that the world is never going to be without speakers or never going to be without the need of speakers. We're not going to be replaced by artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, chatbots. We're not going to be replaced by some virtual renditions of ourselves. I think that people everywhere are always going to want live That's presenters. That's fascinating. Uh, how can you be so sure? Sorry, are you just heckling me? Yeah. Why are you looking out in the audience over there? I'm behind you. Wait. Yes. Up here. Oh. Yeah. Hello. Um, yes, it's, it's me. Who, who are you? <laughs> really, you are a bit slow. I mean, when last did you look in the mirror? I, I mean, literally, the mirror. Uh, okay, fair enough. You're me, but, but oh, why? Yes, obviously, I'm you, and I'm here from the future. You tell people all the time that you live in the future and you love it, well, here I am to tell you that you are wrong. You've been telling this wonderful audience, and, and I know why you've been doing it, because you want to calm them down and you want to help them to feel good about themselves. And you've been telling them that they're going to be fine, that technology won't replace them. Well, <laughs> ta-da, uh, I don't think you're right. Uh, uh, no, hang on a little bit. Don't interrupt me, please. Let me explain. Uh, I'm the one from the future. You see, I think that there are three things that we need to understand about what has happened in the world since 2018. You know, the last five years have been remarkable. We've seen three things that are important. The first is some serious new communication technologies that have come into our businesses, into our world, uh, advances in the way that we connect and communicate, these handheld devices that we've got, virtual reality, holograms, all of these technologies have made it a lot easier for people to engage with a screen, a big screen like this one or a small screen like the one in your hands. The second thing is that a younger generation of young people have come out of an education system that has begun to change and into our workforces, and they're demanding this. They're demanding engagement with technology. They're digital natives, born and brought up in this digital world, and they don't want to come and sit in a training room or sit at a conference and be bored out of their minds. They've changed the way that we communicate. They've abandoned email. They're moving away from face-to-face -face meetings. They want technology. And the third thing is that we need to personalize what we do. This is especially true in the training and meetings and presentations and conferencing spaces. You know that AI stuff and the artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics, all of that has led to us knowing much, much, much more about individuals. It's, it's no longer just the Alibabas and the Amazons of the world saying people who have bought this product also like these other products. That's so 2019. What it is today is us knowing more about you, each of you as individuals. And that means that as an individual, I am expecting for my training, my personal development, my inspiration to arrive in my handheld device tailored and specially just for me. And that's what we've been able to do over the last five years. That's what you guys are going to have to do in the next five years if you want to be successful.
Yep. Hang on, I've got a few questions here. <laughs> I know you've probably got a lot of questions, and I wish I had more time. In fact, the rules of time travel don't allow me to answer some of the questions I'm sure you want to ask. And my time is already up, and I need to be going there. There is just one thing I do need to tell you before I go, and that is about Manchester United and the Champions League. Oh well, we'll just have to win that ourselves. <laughs> now look, obviously we're going to be affected just as much as anybody else is. The technologies that are coming are coming for all of us. And we need to learn how to respond. To respond in a world that is filled with robots and algorithms and machine learning and AI. And that's filled with a world where people no longer need other people to get information. Where does this leave us? Whose main job it is to provide information. How should we respond? Well, I'd like to suggest that there are four ways that we can respond, four things that we can do as speakers to future-proof our careers uh, in the decade that lies ahead. The first thing that we need to do is make sure that we don't compete with the machines. There are things that computers can do that they can do much better than we can do. They can process information, they can gather data, they can uh, produce reports, they can find facts uh, much, much better, much, much faster than us. They don't have to take any breaks, uh, they don't get bored, they don't get tired, uh, they don't in any way need to be human. So we mustn't try and compete with the machines in their space. What we need to do is to make sure that we do the, the, the things that the machines can't do. In other words, in a world dominated by machines, we need to be more human. Now, from a speaker's perspective, that means a number of things. But let me help you to understand what it means by talking about another profession, which I think uh, will get your brains into the right space. So let's think about doctors. I've, I've said that all the professionals, lawyers, accountants, maybe they're easy to understand, engineers possibly, but doctors, are we really going to get rid of the GP in particular, your primary healthcare professional? How many of you would prefer to have a computer do your primary healthcare rather than a GP? So those of you who haven't raised your hands, you haven't been concentrating, um, but it's fine, I'll, I'll take you with me. Here's the, here's the problem. Your local doctor, your GP, gets on average about 72% of his or her diagnoses correct the first time. You know this to be true because one in four times you go to your doctor, you have to go back again because the initial diagnosis, the, the, the pills that were handed out, didn't quite work. Now, in most cases, about 90% of cases, that's not incredibly fatal. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I'm happy with that as a statistic, though. I, I wonder how many of you have ever asked your doctor what your doctor got for their final physiology exam. It, 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 this feels like an important question. You see, your doctor, if, it's, if your doctor's similar to you, I, I studied accountancy, I only had to get 50% to pass. In fact, in my, in my final, final exam, they allowed me to squeak through in accounts three at 45% because they just wanted rid of me. <laughs> Are you happy if your doctor got 50% for Physiology 505? Which half <laughs> of the possible problems you could have are you happy your doctor doesn't know? This feels weird. Then, of course, we must look at the economics of this. Your doctor has no incentive to make you well. No, not financially anyway. Your doctor only sees you when you're sick. Add all of these thoughts together and then discover that IBM has taken one of the world's most powerful computers and has focused its Watson brain onto medical diagnosis. 
And in the last five years, being based at the Carnegie Mellon um, University Hospital, Watson has been going through past histories, learning medicine, reading every medical textbook ever written, looking at every single publicly available medical record available on the planet Earth, and has been given test cases. And right now, IBM Watson, with no human help, is getting a 99.2% accuracy in diagnosis. Add to that the fact that we are now able to sequence our own DNA and we can add in DNA analysis which no human doctor is able to do on their own because it's billions of lines of code that make up your genetics. I've had this done, by the way. I'm sure you've seen the advert on Facebook for this where there's a whole lot of people from different uh, European countries and they all come together and they interviewed first and the guy from Germany says, well, I hate the Turkish and the, the guy from... Turk, uh, you know, from Turkey says, well, I hate the Italians, and the guy from Iceland says, well, I hate everybody. I mean, he's from Iceland. Um, and, and then they do the DNA analysis, and they all discover that they've all got bits of all of these different nations in them. They even discover cousins in the room, tears and everything else. I mean, you can do this analysis now. It costs you about 100 pounds. It'll take a few days, and you get your DNA analysis. I did this for myself, uh, and I discovered much to my horror, and, and Celia, you're absolutely right about an international speaker, I am 98% British. Yeah, B&P material. UKIP will have me any day. Uh, the other 2%, by the way, is Neanderthal. So it's a little bit of a horror show to discover. It means that although I'm a third generation South African, all of my ancestors for thousands of years have only ever lived on this soggy island. They've only ever had sex with other British people and a few monkeys. <laughs> but Dr. Watson, as it's becoming known, is much better at diagnosing what's wrong with me and much better at prescribing a treatment. Wouldn't you prefer to get 99.2% accuracy rather than 75? So what's left for the human doctor to do? Because there are actually three things a doctor does. Diagnose what's wrong with you, prescribe a treatment, and care for you. I know it's a generalization, but most doctors at the moment don't actually care for you. The only time you get a follow-up phone call is if your bill hasn't been paid. In the future, we'll let the machines do the one bit and we get to be more human. Now as speakers, we're going to be replaced by these little things. Natural language processing units that provide chatbot interaction, like an Amazon Alexa. Now, I have one of these things, and I really hope this is going to work, uh, sitting on the side over there. So, uh, Alexa, are you connected to the internet? Yes, I am connected to the internet. So, you can ask this device anything you like. You can get any information you like. Alexa. Multiply 382,712 by 552. 382,712 multiplied by 552 is 211,257,024. Alexa, how tall is Mount Everest? Mount Everest's height is 29,029 feet. 8,848 meters. So I don't need somebody who's climbed up a mountain to tell me about it. <laughs> Alexa, who is the Prime Minister of the UK? The United Kingdom's Prime Minister is Theresa May. Alexa, what do you think of Theresa May? I wasn't programmed with opinions on politics. My creators may have thought it could lead to arguments. I can't imagine why. <laughs> so I don't need a political analyst. <laughs> Except I do. Because Alexa doesn't have an opinion on that. 
And that's part of the problem with Alexa. I wonder what Alexa might have done last night. Alexa, tell us a joke. Did you hear about my dad's restaurant on the moon? The food is okay, but it has no atmosphere. That's not the worst joke you heard last night. <laughs> but yes, I don't think Alexa is going to be winning Speaker Factor or the Comedy Night anytime soon. Do you get what I'm saying here? If we come as speakers and all we do is we're dumping information on the crowd, well, the machines can do that. If all you're doing is coming and throwing up frameworks that you read in somebody else's textbook and talking through it, well, Alexa can do that. If all you're doing is parenting things other people said, repackaging quotations from other people's ideas, well, Alexa can do that. Don't compete with the machines. Be yourself. Be human. The second thing you need to do to future-proof yourself is to make sure that you are constantly adding value. One of the biggest mistakes that I've seen speakers make year over year on year is that they are focusing on their speech. They're focusing on what do I say? How do I package my presentation? What stories can I tell? How can I craft my signature story better? And they've forgotten to ask what problems am I solving? And who has those problems? You can't be a corporate speaker if you're not solving corporate problems. And you're not going to get paid to speak if nobody's got the problem you're solving. Now, entertainers, you're solving a problem, how to keep people awake during an awards ceremony. How to make sure people have fun at an awards ceremony. That's a problem. And you can be the solution. But you've got to know what problem you're solving. And you've got to know which people have the problem. And you've got to know how valuable the problem is if it's solved. Because that's how you set your fee. If you are adding value, solving somebody's problem, and you know whose problem it is you're solving, and you know how valuable it is to them, you will have work. The third thing you need to do is experiment more. Because if you're just going to do in the next 10 years what you have been doing in the last 10 years, you're going to get even less of what you've had before. Some of you have had a lot for the last 10 years, but you're going to get less of it if you think that the last 10 years is the roadmap for the next 10 years. Some of you haven't had much, and you're going to have even less if you don't start to change. And we can't work out what we're going to need in advance. We can't have it all sorted out in our heads and then take it to the marketplace. We have to learn how to experiment more. And when we experiment, we need to realize some of our experiments will fail. Some of our experiments are not going to work. And sometimes we have to be prepared for that. We try something and it doesn't work. And then we try it again and it doesn't work again. And we do it again and maybe it doesn't work. You don't want to be this guy. Don't turn failure into a habit. But learn from our failures. We need to experiment more. That's the first time I've ever interrupted myself in a speech and shared the stage with a chatbot. I think I might do it again. So the fourth, the fourth thing we need to do is to make sure that we are in love with our profession. You are not going to survive the next 10 years on skill and content and a nice little client black book alone. This is a tough job. And the people who have survived the last 10 years and the 10 years before that and the people who have survived the 10 years ahead are the people who are, in addition to everything else, also 
passionate about the value that we do add in a world that's gone mad. Making sense of it, entertaining through it, building people up. What a privilege this profession is. I don't know about you, but I want the next 10 years to just be the start for me. Thank you. Hi, Graham. Give you a gift.